when we talk about profit or we talk about making money, most people automatically think that's greedy, that's selfish, that's bad. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. Now, by way of note, one time, it must have been eight or nine years ago, I had someone write into the podcast and say, Enoch, you got to understand that it, this is not just about the United States. It's not just about one nation. <laughs> he reprimanded me for saying architect nation. And I wrote him back and I said, when I say architect nation, I mean the one nation that all architects belong to. So whether you're listening in the UK, United Kingdom, whether you're listening in Canada, whether you're listening in Indonesia, whether you're lis listening in Luxembourg, whether you're listening in the Netherlands, whether you're listening in Denmark, whether you're listening in Mexico or the Bahamas, you are part of the architect nation. And today we're going to talk about an important topic, which is this money, 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 money. We're going to talk about money. We're going to roll our hands up. We're going to get our hands a little bit dirty as we have conversation about money today. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Joining me today is Business of Architecture co-founder, Ryan Willard. Ryan, welcome. Good to see you again, brother. Always a pleasure. I love, I love these conversations, Enoch. Highlight yeah, of my as, as do I. As, as do I. So money, we're talking, so the conversation today is about money, but it's not just about money. We're not going to talk about, yeah, you know, money's in the US, it's green. You know, a guy from Australia told me that, hey, our money in Australia, you can't tear it. It's made out of plastic. I'm like, that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> but we're going to talk about the culture of money and conversations around money in architectural practices. And this is a conversation that came up in one of the smart practice calls today with uh, the heroic firm owners who are part of the smart practice program, who are learning to embed all of these teachings into their practices so they can have more time, so they can have more fulfillment, so they can make a bigger impact, so they can go on vacation, so they can compensate their team members exceptionally well. So Ryan, give us a little bit of background. What, you know, you and I, we talked about discussing money today, and it had come up in some conversations. When we say the conversation about money in an architectural practice, what are we talking about? We're talking about how money is perceived in a practice. Okay. What do people feel about it? What do they think about it? How do they understand it? What are their emotional reactions to it? Because we're often talking to business owners and, you know, we get down to business and we're like, we're focused on making more money. We're focused on profit. And an interesting conversation came up about the business owner talking about their own financial vision for the practice. They want to make more money. They want to make more money for themselves. They want to take home more salary. They want to take home more reward for the risk that they've been taken. But, and then they said, but I don't want to, um, I don't want to seem selfish. So I'm not sure how to share this with the rest of the team because it's all about me. And I want you guys to make me a lot of money. Oh, and, and, I, and I thought that was interesting because it was reflecting. That's how they actually felt about it. Okay. That they felt on, you know, somewhere that they were somehow manipulating, exploiting, or that they, the team would feel that they were being manipulated and exploited to make, you know, to line the pockets of the owner of the business. Okay. If we talk to, uh, 
a communist or a Marxist, when they talk about capitalism, they literally do not use the word leverage or scaling or, you know, how they talk about workers, they use the word exploitation. Okay. I find this quite frustrating because it's just, it's nonsense and it kind of just plays into a nonsensical victim mentality that's really unproductive and very, un, very, very unhelpful. Um, but it does reflect a reality that many businesses are dealing with is that there is an unhealthy mindset around money and finance in a practice. If we were to start talking about the project managers in an architect practice, from my perspective, this should be called a profit manager. Okay. Ooh, and, I like it. I like it. And their main KPI is the profitability of the project. Okay. They've got to better keep these projects on time, on budget, and maintain the design caliber. Okay. What happens? Mm. They don't do any of that. And they might focus and ma- on and maintain the client experience being a positive. And main- exact, exactly. And maintain the client experience. Often yeah. what happens is they indulge themselves in design. They don't care for the profit. There's nothing to do with them. The practice owner only compounds all of this because they don't give any financial information to a project manager in the first place. So they haven't got they haven't got a clue. What the hell are they doing? What are they managing? Ryan, is 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 this is this a Trumpist doctrine? Are you trying to get us to all vote for Trump? <laughs> Isn't that all he cares about is profit? Exactly. Exactly. That's what we want. We want to see more of his golf courses built around the world. Yeah. Well, and I bring that up because I remember during the campaign, I think it was Hillary and Trump. I don't, maybe it was Biden and Trump. I don't remember. But I think um, the Democrats, they ran a brilliant ad. I'm like, oh, that ad's good. They were denigrating Trump, right? And um, and uh, what the ad, the ad talked about, they went, they found an architect who had been completely stiff oh, I saw this. by I saw Donald this. Trump. Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And I I was incensed. I was like, damn it, I can't believe that that money grubbing magnet is 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 stealing the hard earned effort of architects, right? So I, I bring that up. But here's here's the point, right? Hopefully that 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 we can discuss and our listeners can let then can hear is that when we talk about being all about the money, we're not talking about not being all about client service. So what we stand for here at Business of Architecture is, of course, profit, but also exceptional client service. We're not, you know, hopefully no one walks away from this podcast saying, I'm going to squeeze every last penny out of my consultants. I'm going to delay my invoices and I'm going to withhold payment on the last invoice because I just want all the money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's so, it's such a basic, like, idea. And and what I mean by that is it's, um, it's such a stupid basic way of thinking about money is to just lower it to greed. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's, mm-hmm. that's generally what we just put it very simply. When we talk about profit or we talk about making money, most people automatically think that's greedy, that's selfish, that's bad. Okay? And, and they're so, they're so there's, and I've been there too, Ryan, so bought in to that idea that money's greed, you, they could listen to this conversation and their mind would not be cracked open a bit. They'd still, I don't understand what you're saying. You're speaking Greek to me. It's all about greed. It's nothing but greed. How could mm-hmm. it be about anything else? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's bonkers. Okay. And this is the culture that exists in many practices. This is the culture that exists in the minds of many business owners who run architectural firms. And it's very problematic. It's very constraining to have that kind of, ideology because you're now at a deep level averse or repelling money so you're not going to have difficult conversations with your clients you're not going to aspire to have cash you're not going to build a financial vision you're not going to protect your profit you're not going to look after it you're not going to go and and kind of pursue it because you've got this ideology that it's bad or that it or that the only way of making money is through doing dishonest shifty things it's a very juvenile way of looking at the world. It's very ill-informed. It doesn't have any nuance to it. It doesn't have any kind of reality to it. So when we are talking about it in an in, in architecture practice, and we, we encourage all business owners to be having and facilitating financial conversations with their team and for them to be creating a healthy culture around money and profit. 
And what that means is that there's a wider conversation about money and what it can do and the power of money and that it's a great facilitator and that actually in reality, you know, and I did a, a little survey earlier today, who finds, and to the listeners, listeners now, who finds when they've got more money, they're more generous. You start taking people out for dinners. You start treating people. You start giving money away. You know, sometimes you give more money away to a charity or to the homeless or something like that. You start giving, okay? It, Ryan, it I'm going to be the devil's you. advocate here. How, how do you explain the people who get greedier the more money they have? They were already greedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were already greedy. I, mm -hmm. You know, we often talk about money just being a magnifier of who you already are. And you can be greedy and broke, and you can be greedy and rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Or, or broke and generous and, and rich and generous. And if Absolutely. you're rich and generous, your ability to give is amplified so much you more. Get to be, you get to be more you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get to mm -hmm. be more you. So th yeah. th this is kind of the conversation that needs to be happening in, in businesses and businesses that have got a strong vision and a mission and they're standing for something. Okay, great. Then money becomes a tool for whatever it is that you say you're standing for. Okay. If it's neglected and it's an unhealthy conversation around money and you've got project managers who don't want to know anything about the profit, they don't care or you've, and the only reason they don't care is because you've allowed them not to care. They're under your watch. You haven't created this environment where they're empowered to talk about money. The other part of this conversation, when we talk about money conversations in a in an architectural business, is how resigned most people are about money. Our young generation of architects are being brought up at university. There's often a, a tutor or some wise sage of architecture, apparently, who will tell the students, you're never going to make a lot of money doing this profession literally brainwashing kids into believing that they're not going to make a lot of money doing architecture. You never. Okay. Never so will. now they're being trained to believe that. So they start learning how to be resigned about money early on. This and someone real... gave that same script to the developers and clients too. I don't know where someone was passing around this, 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 uh, this uh, movie <laughs> script, but apparently a lot of people have been putting the script out there, Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild, right? And we have a responsibility to, you know, recognize if we've got that script playing in our own mental faculties. And if we do, then be conscious of it and starting taking it apart, dismantling it, understanding it's that it's an illusion. It's yes, not real. I, and it's not serving you. My name is Enoch Sears, and I am a recovering poverty addict. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our listeners may not have heard my story. So like literally when I got out of architecture school, I was so averse to money. I was so bought into the idea that the production of money and the whole capitalistic system was all built upon greed that mm -hmm. I literally wanted to opt out of it. I'm like, the only way I can like live in this world with conscience is to opt out of the system. And so in college, I lived in my car for a couple semesters. Um, when I, when we were first married, Carly and I, we lived on a sailboat because I didn't want to buy into the whole buy it, get a mortgage. And, you know, I thought if I could just reduce my expenses. So I think I was talking with Carly the first year of our marriage, which would have been in 2003, we earned just over $11,000 for the year. Wow. I was living on a sailboat. I was doing freelance architectural work and I was working maybe, maybe four hours a day. So I was kind of working out. It was awesome. I mean, we, it was, it was fun. <laughs> lifestyle was, I mean it was it was okay we were free you know I remember we we lived in a little uh, a little a little marina down in uh, Kima Texas which is just south mm -hmm. of Houston and Kima is famous for having a boardwalk the Kima boardwalk which has some roller coasters some really cool restaurants etc but just uh, just a stone's throw away from this little tourist attraction there was a shopping center and they had a taco cabana there which is where we'd go if we wanted to splurge and a Wendy's which is where we would go when we wanted a, a budget meal. We were going to eat out. We were going to splurge on ourselves. We'd go to the the Wendy's dollar menu, and we get like we'd get a if if we were feeling very generous and up on our luck, we'd get a frosty. 
Ryan, have you ever had a frosty from from Wendy's? No. Ryan, I must. I must enter. When I'm, when I, how, I'm there next week, there's gonna be a frosty. Yeah, you're coming to LA. We're gonna go. I'll even eat one with you. I mean, it's normally I don't put stuff like that on my body, but for you, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. We'll go get a frosty from Wendy's. <laughs> But is, that's, it just, that was, is it just is it just frosted ice and with like some you know, intense uh, sugary yeah, dye? I don't want to know what's in it. Um, it's not fruity. They're usually vanilla or their um, or their chocolate, and I would probably be terrified to read what's actually in them. Um, I, I would assume there's some sort of milk product in there, but who knows? You know, with fast food nowadays, it's all. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all done through AI now. I think they just McDonald's says, "Hey, make me a hamburger." AI, would you give me the recipe to make? some hamburgers the cheapest amount possible and i think it spits out a recipe i'm not sure don't quote me on that but i'm pretty sure that's how they come up with fast food (laughs) but that's i mean that's that that was my mindset so i'm i'm coming from i mean i'm coming from a culture in my family where Mm. my grandfather my grandfather was um he rose through the ranks of the california school employees association which is the union that represents non-credentialed employees of the California um, school system. So it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar basically company, um, the school system is. And that, so it would include everyone except for teachers. So it would, administrators would be part of that, um, janitors would be part of that, bus drivers. And uh, you know he started as a lobbyist for them. So he'd go lobby. This is back when Governor Brown was the governor. Jerry Brown was governor in California. Um, and he would go lobby and hang out with Governor Brown and he'd he'd lobby for better better wages for school employee school employees. And uh, he did a great work. Like my grandfather grew up in the depression. He was in the Navy. He was a police officer in Los Angeles for a bit. And he rose to become the executive of the CSEA, the California School Employees Association. People loved him. He loved people, people loved him. Um but he he did have, and I don't know if my mom got this from him or not, but my mom once told me, she said, people don't get wealthy by being honest. Mm. So that's the way I was raised. I was raised that if you had wealth, like my parents were both educators. My father was had a master's degree in education. He was a teacher. Uh, my mom was also a teacher. So they were academics. And, you know, we my mom made our money stretch. I grew up in a family of nine kids. I'm the oldest of nine kids. And, you know, growing up, I remember there were many days we'd go to the fridge and the fridge was empty. There was like not really any food in there. Uh, so my mom made do. She stretched out the dollars that we had. I had, you know, kids at school thought I was rich, but I was just wearing hand-me-down clothes from the local uh, Salvation Army or from family members. So I was raised with, you know, and when my mom told me that, that kind of represents the ethos of how I was raised, Ryan, mm-hmm. it was that, um, you know, there was that like the only way the only way to get wealth was to was to cheat other people. And my mom, bless her heart, was an amazing person. I remember one she tried to instill in us the um, she tried to instill in us charity and giving and sharing and compassion towards others. As an example, I remember it was one it was one Christmas time. It was very cold, and I was going to bed. I was actually already fast asleep. And my mom comes in, and she says, "Enoch, I have a request for you." And I said, "What's that?" And she says, "Well." You know, there's this this immigrant family. Uh, they go; they're members of our church, and I've realized that they live in a very small, kind of one bedroom home. It's very cold. They don't really have a lot of resources, and so I was wondering if you would give your donate your blanket, so we could go take it to this family. And so I said, hell yeah! I mean, here I am in this nice house. At least I have warmth. Yeah, I'll give up my blanket. You know, no no big deal. I don't need the blanket. And so my mom took us. We packed everything up and went and we visited this family who um, the father was an immigrant from Mexico, the mother as well. Uh, the kids were enrolled in school. And I just remember my heart being really touched when we did that, like being able to give something, even as a kid, like giving my own blanket so these other kids could experience warmth. And, mm. um, you know, so that, that impacted me. So, you know, as as I've shifted my mindset about money and understanding that wealth is important, I haven't lost that reminder of humanity, that we're all mm-hmm. human beings here and that, being a human being is not about amassing wealth. It's not about, you know, stacking gold bars in some bank account somewhere so we can be safe from the coming cataclysm, right? But it's about, sure, you want to be safe and sure, you want to make sure you're provided for. Just like, you know, in an airplane, when the oxygen mask comes down, they always tell you, put your own mask on first. 
So you need to get your mindset right. You need to get your finances right. When you're in a place of abundance and wealth, then you can help other people get into a place of abundance and wealth. And if there's, you know, one of the things I le- I saw, I, I was reminded of being down in Peru last week again, was that uh, they need education. They need resources. They need sustainable practices. When I say they, I mean developing nations, places where there's not the kind of opportunity that I was gr- grown up with here in the U.S. And so as, as people that are born into a first world nation, if you're listening and you're in a developed nation, you know, I mean, you don't... <sighs> The world's not going to require anything of you. Like you don't have a responsibility to do this, but it's an opportunity for you to take up the responsibility of becoming a wealth generator and becoming someone that can contribute positively. And I believe that all of our listeners here in in the podcast, probably with the exception of two or three people fit into that category. (laughs) So if you're... (laughs) I I think this is really quite beautiful right to consider a our own personal relationships with money as you're you're telling that story there I was kind of reflecting back as well on what you're saying and it was reminding me of my own upbringing with with money and you know I feel like I've been quite blessed in the sense that I got very good money lessons from my family in Ones that have ones that have done well. I've seen I've seen my parents go from not having much to having you know a decent level of career and and abundance and wealth and to watch their retirement and them enjoying the kind of fruits that they created and you know it's not extravagant and by any means but it's you know, they're two accountants. Do you know what I mean? So they 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 were they were thinking about they're, these they're things. They're prudent. They're prudent. <laughs> they're prudent and frugal and. There was, and and, there, and but also there was always an aspiration of, an aspiration for wealth, like it was viewed as important. It was viewed as and I think this is quite an Indian thing as well, like that you're supposed to be wealthy. Okay. Now, that's, is that the case? Do you know much about Indian culture? I'm curious if that's the case for other castes, as they say over there. What the what that's like I, on the, the I, mainland? I, po- possibly, possibly. There's there's certainly something about the so you know the the caste that my mum is from and in that and that kind of indian culture of success and working hard and making sure that you know there's a that kind of philosophy of to to whom much is given much is expected and just a belief that you know we're supposed to be we're supposed to be wealthy and it's and also that's accompanied with it doesn't come without hard graft it doesn't come without it, it being there, um, or, you know, you having to exchange something for it. And there was a kind of respect in general around it. Okay. There's, there's still a sort of suspicion of like, you know, huge, vast amounts of, of wealth. And it was interesting what you were saying as, as well, like coming out of university, um, I definitely echoed some of those sentiments of wanting to drop out and, you know, kind of didn't quite fathom the, the, what I didn't, I didn't understand or, or appreciate career choices or what a creative career choice was. And certainly there was something appealing about breaking out of boundaries and not being part of this system and the system is broken and it doesn't work and it's unfair. There's a lot of it's unfair. Okay. A lot of it's unfair as opposed to now which is much more like ah this is an interesting mechanism of how money works and how business works and actually i have the freedom and the resources and we're in a really incredible scenario being in the us and the uk you can speak english it's the language of business it's the language of commerce there's all of this technology available there's all of these opportunities there's all these different ways that we can serve other people and create something and make make money out of it so this is i think you know what we're talking about here is we've got to do some kind of audit in our own businesses in our architecture firms what are the unspoken financial conversations that are having people are having and guarantee you so many young architects there they've got either resignation about money or there's what might be perceived by you as the leader as an entitled attitude to it 
So I should be getting paid more. We should be getting raises all the time, as opposed to a healthy conversation of, you know, someone comes to you in your team, they say, I want to have $150,000 of salary. And you say, I want to pay you this. And here's what $150,000 salary is going to look like. Okay. But I need you to be able to do this. This is the, this is what $150,000 worth of value for my business looks like. Okay. And if you can do these things and we can help you learn some of these skills, but these are the values, uh, or the thing, the, the value exchange that needs to happen, then we can get you to that $150,000. Okay. Great. I mean, it's the same thing that we do in our businesses with our clients, right? Where we have, we're learning to market and sell and understand what is actually of value to, to the marketplace as opposed to just expecting that I should be getting paid more without any more, you know, without just trying to understand what the mechanism is at play, not what you want the mechanism to be, what the mechanism actually is of value exchange. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've made all the mistakes in the book, which is, I mean, that's part of life. We, we make the mistakes and it's okay. But I remember having a conversation with one of my employers, Ryan. And I remember specifically saying that, like telling him that, I I requested a raise and I was at the point where experience wise, like I was due for a raise. There's no doubt about it. But the way that I approached the conversation, I remember saying something along the lines of like, my rent has gone up. I need a raise, (laughs) 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 which is, you know, it's, it's typically, it's, it's how we, it's how we experience it as employees. We, we typically think that we need a raise because of our circumstances have gone up, but the the business owner mindset looks at it completely differently. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if you're an employee now, and you're listening to this, like probably you're smarter than I was, but uh, if you're not smarter than I was, again, maybe two or three of you, uh, then, you know, have the, like when you talk to your employer, you want to be talking to them in terms of the value that you're going to bring. How can you add value to the business? And then you're having a real conversation around money. When we're talking about the unspoken about money, probably the biggest one is going to be that, that multiplier that we deal with in architectural practices, Right. Like I'm paid 30,000, uh, I'm paid, let's say I'm paid $30 an hour and I'm looking at our billing rate sheet and our, you know, I'm being charged out at $120 an hour. So it's very common in the industry for uh, employees or people that aren't firm owners to look that's at that good, and to good, say, good business there. Yeah, I know it's 30 and that's a three is a four time multiplier. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, great. So, yeah. So we look at that as employees and we say, geez, you know, oh man, I am being exploited. I mean, we not, might not say that, but I even remember thinking that myself. I, I had a little bit of that conversation happening in my head as an employee. Sometimes it's some days more, some days less. But the idea of like, wow, geez, man, this employer is making tons of money off of me. You know, oh my goodness, they're charging me out for $150 an hour and I'm being paid 30 bucks an hour or something like that. Right. So this is, as a firm owner, you want to know if this conversation is happening in your practice. And when I say happening in your practice, I mean, is it happening in the minds of your employees? Because if your employees are thinking this, then it's going to impact their performance. It's going to impact their culture. It's going to impact their engagement. It's going to impact how they show up at work. And so the first person you need to get right in the head about this idea of the multiplier is yourself. Like you need to be convinced that you are due, you, you, you deserve a profit. If you're apologetic about your profit in any way, shape or form, then that is going to rub off onto your employees as well. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're, you're now creating something shifty about it. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying yeah, to hide it. You right. don't wanna, you know, you're not comfortable with it. So you Mm -hmm. feel like you're doing something shifty. So the team now thinks that you're doing something shifty. The team is just going to reflect you. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The team is just going to be reflecting of you. Interestingly, today's conversation, we were talking about entitlement and the the conversation that we'll often hear from business owners where they, they perceive their team members to be being entitled. Okay. It's not necessarily that that's not true. However, it's, just a way of perceiving it's an interpretation of some behaviors okay so there you go it's going to be true if you believe it to be true but if you want to kind of have something useful then we can take responsibility for it that you're projecting them you're well you're imbuing somebody as being entitled with a behavior you're labeling it and if they are 
being entitled. Well, they're under your watch. They're in your business behaving the way that they're behaving under your leadership. So who's responsible for that? You are. And if you take that responsibility, that they are your team members are a reflection of you and your own behavior, where are you being entitled? And then we start to have quite an interesting conversation. This can be quite, okay, well, actually, I've got all these entitlements about my employees. They should be showing up at 8.30 and they should be wanting to stay till 10 p.m. They should love this business. They should dedicate everything. They shouldn't um, take time off. They should be working extra hours. They should be happy and enthusiastic all through the all through the day. We have these kind of crazy entitled expectations of what we think our employees should be doing. And yet we never have any kind of conversations about expectations or clearly map out what's important. We don't even know what's important to them. Exactly. And so you're, here's the principle here is that it's your job as a firm owner. When I say job, it's your opportunity as a firm owner to educate your team members. They just don't know. They just don't, no one's ever told them before. Like this was me as a, as a young employee. Like I thought that I deserved a raise when my rent went up. I thought that's, that was what triggered a raise. That's what triggered me to look for another job when my expenses went up. Like if, if my employer would have been a little bit more savvy and would have been able to teach me about value, teach me about value creation in a business, teach me about why profit's important for a business. Mm -hmm. Why is it important that a firm owner takes, takes home profit? Obviously, there's some reinvestment that's important. It's important that for a firm to have profits so they can reinvest that back into the growth of the business. Buying the next generation computers, training the employees, investing in marketing, training and getting, keeping up with the different advances in the marketplace, and also taking that profit home for themselves and for their family. Like that's important. There's a reason why that needs to happen in a profitable business. One of the things that blew my mind is we've been in this consulting role to support, help, and liberate other architectural practice owners, Ryan. And tell me I'm wrong here. What we found is that when, when firm owners start paying themselves more and when they start taking home healthy profit, like when they're starting to actually take home a lot of profit, they're building themselves wealthy, the, the practice prospers, the practice starts making more money. Generally speaking, the people there get raises. They get bigger bonuses. It's interesting when all these pieces come together, the whole rising tide starts to lift all the boats. And so one of the mistaken principles that we think in our mind is that the way that I serve my practice best is by limiting my salary, by taking home less money, by trying to be as economical as possible with my expenses. Well, certainly as, as stewards of money, we don't want to be frivolous with how we spend it. But there's something about being able to take home massive amounts of cash and stewarding it wisely that then has an impact on your business, how you show up as a business owner, the opportunities your team members have. Have you seen this too, Ryan, or is it, is it just my just imagination? You. I haven't seen it. <laughs> that's what I, I thought. That's it. what I thought. Most of the world's just me. <laughs> it, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, we've got, we've got a few clients who who have amazing salaries, amazing take home. I'm talking like half a million and above. And, you know, I, I, I get surprised when I see these numbers, but, and it's like, wow, why didn't anyone tell me that this, you can make this amount of money as an architect? You know, it's, it's amazing. We've got one, you know, client, we've got a couple of clients who have been in the sort of 800,000 to even a, a million dollar mark of personal take home. And when we've spoken about this on the past and, you know, either on, on social media or uh, all these podcasts, there's always a, a kind of comment or somebody will kind of snap back and be like, oh, but they must be doing terrible design work and they're exploiting all their staff and their staff aren't getting paid properly. And you're like, no, every business where we see the business owner taking home healthy, healthy salaries like that, their team are always paid well above the AIA averages. And there's a great culture. People enjoy working there if they stick around. Yeah. People enjoy For working clients, there. Yeah. Cause they, yeah, people they, they have, they have long-term, you know, retention with, with team members, very healthy, very abundant. Yeah. Yeah. So the principle here that we, that we'd like to leave you with is simply this. 
drop your Marxist ways. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm it. teasing. I'm joking. But... No, you're not. <laughs> well, I'll say that. I'm not teasing and joking. Absolutely. <laughs> drop the Marxist ways that are all about I mean, not I, becoming wealthy. I often wealthy. say that if you're, if you're a communist, you're going to have some problems with business of architecture. This is not going to be the place for you. This is not the show for you. Yeah, this is definitely not the show for you. And, you know, if you are communist, you're probably happy with gigantic concrete blocks of uninspiring dwellings. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're all about the money here. So, yeah, so the, what the invitation here for you as as a as a as a um, a capitalist pig is to first of all check your mindset. Like where are you at with this conversation around money? Where are you at with the conversation around money yourself? Like, where are you entitled? Where are you in scarcity? Where do you think that the world owes you something? Where are you not looking at things in terms of a value equation? And as you begin to get your mind right, your business will begin to get its mind right. Your team members will begin to get their minds right. When I say right, I mean abundant, free architect, liberated architectural professional, empowered to do your best work and make your best impact. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is something very powerful about investing in mental hygiene around money, and it doesn't, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Like whatever like level, you, whatever level you're at, like there's still. I mean, I, I still have loads of thing. I surprise myself with like reactions I have to certain things that I might see financially sometimes. And I'm like, Oh, why was I, I didn't think that was good. Or my mind immediately went till they must be doing something shifty. Mm, and mm -hmm, you're like, mm -hmm. Oh, and I catch myself and you're like, Oh, that's, mm -hmm. why is that the assumption? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, Ryan. It's deep. So it's we, a deep, Deeply ingrained in, in our kind of modern day in, culture. Yeah, in, in the collective consciousness, as Carl Jung might say. Yeah. So, hey, look, our invitation to you, our faithful, amazing listeners out there on the front lines of architecture is simply this. Join the conversation here. Come drop a note on the YouTube video that is that that is around this episode. Send us emails. Give us feedback about this conversation for you. Like our goal here is to lead a movement of wealth, consciousness, abundance, and prosperity for architectural professionals. We have to attack it one industry at a time, right? We're not, we're not speaking to lawyers. The lawyers are going to do their thing. We're not speaking to doctors. Doctors will do their things. We're not speaking to janitors. Janitors are going to do their thing. We're speaking to, this is a community of architects, design professionals, and interior designers. We accept you as part of the tribe as well. You know, any engineers who listen to this podcast, eh, nothing wrong with that. You know, just make sure you have the architect badge on when you come to the mixers. But other than that, you know, we, we'll accept you. We'll accept your kind around here. The idea is that it's by, <laughs> by shifting our mindset, your mindset, you know, we need, we need, the world is desperate right now. We need to lead, a, shift a movement in terms of wealth consciousness here. And it starts with architects. It starts with architects. Like you are the bastions of abundance it, for developers, for we your clients. We need wealthy architects, scenic. Like we, we I absolutely. couldn't think of a better group of people to get money. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Right. It's like agreed. There's just architects with a shitload of money are going to make the world better. I think so. Absolutely. I mean, imagine the communities it's they could plan. It's simple as that. Exactly. So I feel good about what we're doing here, Ryan. Personally, I yeah. feel good. You know, we're not you know, this isn't, this isn't a podcast about how to run a better drug cartel. You know, those are not probably yet. people who don't need more, don't need more money. Yeah. Not yet. I think that's bus business of, what would we call that show? The business of cartels? Business of cocaine. Business of cocaine. <laughs> you know, actually I saw a funny tangent here and, and, and if you're listening and you already bounced out, no problem. But uh, I, I can't remember. I saw a documentary once, like literally that like being a drug dealer they deal with the same issues and it's one of the best business educations out there is like running a drug operation. It blew my mind. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you have to, you have to surprised. hire, you have to recruit. You got to know I your mean, market. You got to learn how to sell. You got to, you got to understand your market. You got to understand your prospects. Plus you might get killed. 
I mean, it's you gotta, taken you business. Let, to you gotta look after level. your inventory. You can't squander your own yep. inventory. Yep, yep. Don't use the product. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Business is everywhere. Business is everywhere. It's not just. I, it's not just for I, architects. Talking of drug dealers, I once did a job where I was I was a salesperson on a, for for a charity, and we used to travel around in a car. And at the week at the weekend, we this was in Australia, and we'd go to some random town in the middle of nowhere, and then we would be released into the streets the next day. And I'd be there with a the clipboard, and you'd be doing whatever sales pitch you had to get people to sign up their credit card details to donate to whatever charity it was. Um, and we used to have team leaders, and one time the team leader that I was with was he was an ex. Um, he was an ex-junkie and he cleaned up his life and turned himself around, but we ended up going back to his hometown, okay? And he, he took us to some of the old haunts that he used to go to and like the trailer parks and we met some of his old friends. It was sketchy as hell. We met some sketchy, sketchy people. And he told us this wild story about how he used to deal drugs in nightclubs and he used to go into the nightclub with flyers and he used to dress as a gorilla and he said because the costume was so outlandish that everyone just thought he was there marketing and no one would be that stupid to be selling no no person no drug dealer would be that stupid to be selling drugs in a oh, dressed geez. as a gorilla oh man <laughs> And he uh, said, did he have some sort of funny, the- funny tagline, you know, like, like get, get your pot from the silverback or something or <laughs> what was this? <laughs> oh man. Uh, it was hilarious. And he said, yeah, he used to, he used to go and used to, and the gorilla suit was really useful because he could store loads of drugs in it. And then he'd just go out <laughs> oh, dancing geez. and ev- and everyone was like, yeah, it's the gorilla. And then there you go. He'd- get your, get your hooked up from the gorilla. Yeah, yeah, you you brought to mind another another story. So I ha- actually have a, f- a friend slash colleague of mine that I ran into in one of the mentoring groups that I'm in. Legit, this guy was a drug dealer for the cartels. He grew up just south of the border, uh, south of El Paso, Texas, and um, in in um, Juarez, Ciudad Juarez. And dude, the stories he tells about the stuff he would do and drop offs and pickups and the way the drug world works is crazy. But it was about business, but what he was telling me, what he's doing now is actually really inspirational. He is, uh, his wife runs a mortgage company. He's in a real estate and he's, he's start he's launching a coaching program, helping convicts that have been involved in the drug trade, get out and apply all the skills that they've learned in oh, wow. constructive ways and making tons of money. Super cool. Super cool. This guy's got a heart of gold and it's just people out there. Yeah. So I mean, we joke about wealth consciousness, but it's happening everywhere. Well, there's, um, I can't remember the name of the guy, but there was a, an Italian mobster who was like a head of a big Italian family in, I think it was in New York, who he's now in his 70s and he's done jail time. And he's now doing lots of um, public talks and tours and he's talking about the, the kind of mechanics of the, of the mob and how it works. Um, he's really interesting because he, again, he's kind of illustrating it's, there's some, there's business principles there, just not the same kind of ethics that we would yeah, advise everyone right. to be. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that the guy? Is that the grim? Is that the guy? That guy's I a rub. There's a Russian mobster. There's a Russian mobster that puts out lots of really cool content. It's called the grim. It's like some sort of coaching organization. Anyways, um, He's entertaining to watch. He's got so you like can make, he's got like silver teeth and stuff. So clearly you can make money doing sketchy things and you can make a lot of money doing very noble things. That's right. Absolutely. And that's our invitation to you. So that's what smart practice is about. Smart practice is about empowering the generation of conscious individuals who are going to use their money consciously, who are going to create abundance uh, in a time when the world needs it now more than ever. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice. 
the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.